when I was asking God what to pray for, I had a really difficult time. I'm going to be honest. Like, I just couldn't. My mind was blocked. There were things happening in my life that were just preventing me from really diving into prayer and, and figuring out what it was that God wanted me to share with you. And the one thing that I heard God say was, well, where, where do you feel my love, right? And this lesson kind of comes from this lesson. See, I think I'm a teacher right now. This sermon comes from that, where do I feel um, God's love. But before I dive into that, I have two questions that I want you guys to go back into those same groups and go through together. So the first one is, what is your favorite nature scene that you have visited? It can be here in Michigan, it can be outside of Michigan, it can be here in Grand Rapids. Um, and two, why do people like to spend time in nature? I was recently following this woman who hiked across the entire state of Oregon in 14 days by herself. Uh, it was over 400 miles. And I'm just thinking, like, why, why would she want to do that? Like, why do people like to spend time in nature? And I do, too. And I know my reasons why I like to. But I want you to go back into your groups and think about these two questions. What is the favorite scene in nature that you've ever visited? And number two, why do people like to spend time in nature? I think ever since I was young, I loved nature. I loved being outside. Um, I loved just like seeing the, the different animals that just lived around my, my house, whether it was the cats and the snakes, the tarantulas, or the puppy I found on the side of the road and I picked up and I brought home and my mom wasn't very happy about, right? So I always loved spending time outside. There was always something in me that was filled that nothing else could be fit, that nothing else could fill it unless that I was outside. I am that person that loves watching documentaries. I love planet Earth, planet Earth, our planet, and just seeing all that is out there. Because I think, well, if I may never be able to go out there and see it, I might as well just watch it on my TV for now until one day I can experience some of these things. But above all of those things, I love how much nature. Um, connects me with God. It helps me appreciate him as my creator. That, that's the thing that nature does for me. And when I say I'm glad you're here, I don't mean I'm glad you're here at Mosaic, right? A place that is like home for many of us. Um, I don't mean that I'm glad you're here in Grand Rapids, the city that many of us call home. I actually mean that I'm glad you are here. And today I'm going to share with you some lessons from nature and also some lessons from nature that connect really specifically to scripture that have really helped me appreciate God a lot. When I was preparing the sermon, <clears throat> I was saying, God, what do you want me to teach? And he was like, I don't want you to teach anything. I want to tell Mosaic Church something, right? Because I was putting it in my head that I was the one that had to prepare something really deep, something really profound that I could bring to you this morning and that would have made it worth it for you to wake up, right? Come here, bring your mug, get your coffee. But then he just like shut that all down. He was like, nope, it's not about you. He was like, it's all about me. And so today I'm going to share with you some things that for me show it's all about God and how his hand is in all things. Um, so really today, God was just telling me, I need you to get your eyes off of your problems I need you to stop looking at your problems, the, the things that you're carrying, the things that are heavy, and I need you to put your eyes on me. And so today I'm going to show you some things that hopefully can help you put your eyes on Jesus, especially God, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who made all that we see and that we enjoy. Um, these are three pictures that I've taken over the last two years. Two of those are in Yellowstone. One of them is in the Badlands National Park. Um, when I was growing up, I would have never imagined being able to travel. Like my family, we just didn't travel. We didn't have the money and we didn't have the time. But as I grew up in the school that I'm at, I actually now have the amazing opportunity to go to these places every single year, but also take students that, like me, could have never had this opportunity was it not for the school that I work at. So these are three lessons uh, that I've taught at one place or at uh, one time or another at my school. And I have one of my students, and she said she doesn't remember my lessons at all. So maybe we'll quiz her at the end of the sermon and see what she remembers. First thing, I need one volunteer. All right, he already stood up. All right, come on, Mario. You might enjoy this one. All right, 
Resistance and resilience, okay? So, Mario, I need you to push me. Uh. <laughs> All right, what am I doing? Go ahead, do it again. Keep doing it. Resistance. What am I doing? Resisting. I'm resisting, right? My feet are still planting. I'm not moving. Now I need you to push me again. Now what did I do? I kind of fell over. Now, hold on. I kind of fell over, right? But what did I do after I got off my spot? Came back. I came back up, right? Thank you. You may sit down. I'm sure you like that. So resistance and resilience. So one of my favorite things is that nature is resistant. Nature, organisms, uh, plants, they're really actually intelligent. They have such specific purpose and design to them that they're able to resist the things that are happening around them. It has been found in different studies that in short periods of drought, when there's not enough rain, plants will actually close the openings on their leaves. So like we have pores, plants have something very similar and they're called stoma. If it's one is stoma, if it's two is stomata. All right, so plants will close those openings to retain water inside of them so that they can survive in times of extreme drought. Did you know plants can do that? No, and that's like a plant, right? Um, Nature is also resilience. Sometimes natural disasters occur, whether it's an eruption, a tornado, a hurricane, a fire, and it takes time. It may take hundreds of years, but eventually nature will come back. Forests will recover. Plants will start to grow back. Um, organisms will start to move in. And I'm gonna show you an example of that in just a second, but nature is both resistant and resilient. Anybody ever been in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan? Anybody been, anybody been to this specific place? Three of us, four of us, five, all right? So this is, Josh is like, maybe? You, you want me to zoom in a second? Or you, this is um, Chapel Rock in the Michigan Upper Peninsula. A couple of years ago, I went on a hike to the UP with some friends. It was not in the fall and it was not in the winter. I was not cold, so that's why I liked going on this hike. Um, one of the things that we came across was this rock formation. And you see that there is this tree and kind of this, you want to call it a cliff? Well, that wasn't a cliff, that wasn't a little mountain many, 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 many years ago. That was actually all soil, that was all ground. All right? And this is a mixture of sandstone and limestone. And you have these waves, right? And for many seasons, for many years, hundreds of years, this formation has been hit by the waves. It has been hit by the wind. Um, whatever has come that this, this rock, this tree's way, it is still there. The reason why I show you this picture is because I want to tell you about the amazing power of roots. Anybody here into gardening? Thanks, Mel. I knew if I raised my hand and you were here, Melanie would at least know what I'm talking about. Roots are extremely important for plants. They provide uh, a place to, to stand. They also provide nourishment. Now, the cool thing about roots is that roots are actually keeping that tree in place. If it weren't for those roots, all that ground would have been torn down because it, be, it keeps being hit by the winds and by the waves. And year after year, that tree is still there. And the reason why I show you this is because when we think about roots, we got to think about what you are rooted in. What are you rooted in? This tree still stands. This root right here, there used to be soil that was underneath it. But over time, that soil went away and that root still connects the tree to the soil that it needs in order to provide the foundation, in order to stay strong. And although the seasons change, we have to be reminded that we need to let our roots grow into the Father, to let our lives be built on Him so that our faith will be strong. And in the truth you were taught, you will overflow with thankfulness. Trees, I, I love looking at trees. They're really pretty. But when I thought about this, what am I rooted in? Am I rooted in the things that people say about me? Am I rooted in the things my pastor says? Am I rooted in the things my husband says? Am I rooted in the things social media says? What am I rooted in? The only thing that should matter is that I'm rooted in the love of Christ and who he says that I am. Because that is the truth that will remain forever and ever. Amen? Amen. All right. I'm going to skip that one for now. Did you know that wolves can change rivers? 
They don't come around with uh, shovels, by the way, or sit on little bulldozers and dig out you know, new pieces. They don't do that. They, they really don't do that. But wolves can change rivers. In Yellowstone National Park, we were just there. This is a picture that I took when our bus overheated and we had to stop on the side of the road. But at least I could stop and look at the view, right? So there was like a, shoot, my bus is overheated. But yay, I get to stand here and look at this view and these rolling hills, right? Sometimes a bad thing can lead you into a good thing. I don't know if you believe me on that. But Yellowstone National Park, there has been a study there that um, in the 1920s, as ranchers were developing and they had cattle out in Montana, there's a lot of grazing land for cattle, the wolves were actually, they considered interfering with their farms. And so they opened hunting for wolves. There was like open wolf hunting. So you can go and shoot wolves if they were on your property to protect your cattle because that was your business. So for many years, the wolves were not there. In nature, take a guess, what do wolves feed on? Deer, right? Other animals, antelopes, um, elk, things like that. So if there are no deer, sorry, if there are no wolves, what is going to happen to the deer? The deer? They're going to overpopulate. If they overpopulate, what do deer eat? Grass. They eat crops, right? So now you get this low, almost nothing, wolf population, a lot of deer eating all of this grass, uh, causing something called desertification, where land turns into a desert. And because there are no plants, when the winds come, it just blows the soil everywhere, and then plants cannot grow there, right? Does that sound like a good thing? No. no. So cattle, I mean, cattle ranchers are happy because there are no wolves eating their cattle, but the land is sad because the land is not as it should be. Now, in 1995, which is not that long ago, uh, wolves were reintroduced into Yellowstone National Park. After 70 years of wolf populations being, being down, that's a lot of time for nature to be impacted. But when the wolves were reintroduced, they found out that, yes, wolves hunted and killed animals, and that brought their populations down, but wolves actually changed the behavior of the deer, of the antelopes, of the elk. Now, when this happened, the deer did not go into certain places, especially valleys where there would be open space for the wolves to see them and hunt them down. And so when the, the deer and the elk and all of these other animals start to move away from certain places, those places start to regenerate. So talk about resilience. Now they're not, the, the soil actually has time to grow back the plants that are needed for this space. Let me show you all that happened. I'm going to try my best to remember. All right. All that happened, you see trees. There were areas in the national park where the trees quintupled in size in six years. The trees just started to grow like crazy. When the trees start to grow back, the songbirds move back in. Anybody ever been on a walk and you just hear the birds? And they just like kind of, some people are scared of birds. I respect that. Um, but the, the birds start moving in now. So now your songbirds increase. Because the deer and the elk are moving away, the beavers move in. And beavers and wolves are actually something called ecosystem engineers. They have a huge impact on the environment. What do beavers build? Why would you swear, guys? <laughs> right? So they build dams. And dams are a habitat for animals like ducks, amphibians, muskrats, and more. Now, the wolves also started hunting coyotes. Coyotes eat animals like rabbits and mice and voles. So you have this explosion of impact, of interactions that start to come just from the wolves being reintroduced. The ravens and the bears come in and start feeding on the carcasses of the animals that the wolves are hunting. Um, the wolves change the behavior of the rivers. Remember how I said wolves change rivers? The way that they did that is because now there were no deer that were eating the grass right at the banks of the rivers. So the roots of the grass lay down, and when the rivers come, that soil is not being broken and washed away anymore. So the rivers start to meander less. They're more straight. They're, more, uh, they're causing less impact when it comes to erosion. The regenerating forest also stabilized the banks of the rivers, and they collapsed less often. So when the wolves come in, they don't un only hunt and kill. They actually brought a lot of life back into the national forest. 
And, and you think of this, and did you know that there were all of those interactions and species connections at Yellowstone National Park? And it's not at Yellowstone National Park. That's also here in Grand Rapids in any park that you go to. There are all of these connections that we don't see. And to me, this is extremely intentional and extremely purposeful that there is a God that made a park, a world such as this, with creatures that depend on one another, right? And we can say we depend on one another as well. And I, I found this psalm, and the psalmist writes a lot of psalms that give glory and honor to God for his creation, for all that he has done. And it's, all, it's just like just giving God credit and just saying like, man, God, I'm in awe of all that you've done. So Psalm 104, verse 24 to 25, the whole psalm is just saying like, you made these animals and you did this thing and you did that thing and it's all for your glory. And I picked this part specifically and it says, oh Lord, what a variety of things you have made. In wisdom, you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here's the ocean or this park, uh, vast and wide, teeming with life of every kind, both large and small. There's no chance. There's no randomness. There's an intelligent and intentional design in all of this. And the psalmist knew it. Right? I need two more volunteers to come up. You've already volunteered, buddy. I got Josh, though. Brooklyn, I'm going to ask you if you want to move because I don't want you to get hurt. <laughs> All right. I got this. And I, I had a feeling Josh was going to volunteer. That's why I brought the, the Michigan basketball. Right. That's mine. Um, I need one more person to help me. Daniel, you want to stand behind that Michigan, and then you guys are going to switch turns. All right. I will get destroyed. All right. Daniel, your job is just to catch the ping pong balls. That way I don't have to catch lose time. Yes, yeah, because Josh... You have three shots. You see these two lines right here? Yep. All right. Your job is to make sure one of those ping pong balls will land and stay within those two lines. <laughs> okay. All right. You get three. You get three. And then you guys are going to switch. Ooh. You get three. All right. It's got to land and That's stay. It's got to land and stay. Like. It can bounce here first. It's got to land and stay. Okay. <laughs> it's crooked floor. <laughs> oh, get that dog. Oh, it's the interference, interference. It's okay. It still doesn't count. It's still, yeah, it's still count. No, actually, it still counted. You still didn't get it in. That's what I meant. What? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's switch. Daniel, your turn. Boo. Boo. <laughs> Get him out of there. Get him. All right. Oh, what is it? Oh, like oh. oh. Too much. How's this? Man, give it up for my, my awesome volunteers here. Yeah, you got me. Thank you very much. How how was that, guys? How was? Need more tries. Need more tries, Josh. That was difficult. That was that was kind of hard, right? That was difficult. Do you think you could have done it if I gave you infinite tries? Yes. You think so? Infinite. Like infinite. The rest of time, yes. Yes. Eventually, Eventually somewhere yeah. down the road, you would. Keep practicing. All right, thank you guys for volunteering. Give it up for my, my awesome volunteers. Now, I want you to keep that image in mind, all right? I left the, the basketball there for a reason, and then I still have those two, two lines right there to represent something. I'm going to get to it in a second, all right? It's all connected. And if it's not, um, I did my best, all right? And we're just going to keep going. So, a miracle planet. Um, all life needs three things. First one, which represents? Starts with an E. Starts with an energy. energy. represents energy, all right? The middle one, 
not otters. They're cute. Water. Water, right? Also, otters are also a keystone species. You take away an otter from its ecosystem, the whole ecosystem falls apart. Fun fact. So let's keep the otters. The last one is food, nourishment. All life needs three things. Now, all life um, derives its nourishments from six elements. That's it. So if you ever saw the periodic table, by the way, I was going to ask this. Um, anybody here had science as their least favorite class growing up? Yeah, a little bit, right? Would anyone say, yes, science was my favorite. I couldn't wait to go there every single day. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Camille. All right. So all life derives from six nourishments. Sorry, sorry six elements. All of those elements can actually be found in any planetary body in our solar system. So why is it that we are here and there's no life in, in these other places? Anybody have a guess? What is it, Christy? God. God. Yep. Answer to everything. God. Now, the thing that is really important is not the otters, but water. Water in its liquid state, not its solid state, which is ice, and not in its gaseous state, which is vapor or steam, right? All of these. So what is it about our planet? If all of these other planets also have these six elements, what is it about ours that is so special besides God? Liquid water. Liquid water. It has an atmosphere, right? Good job. That was actually really precise, right? It, where's the mugs? Give him a mug. That was awesome. <laughs> so... Our atmosphere. Now, the, our atmosphere and our location is actually key for liquid water to exist on our planet, which allows us to also exist. If our atmosphere is too thick, then it will be too warm, actually. If it was too thick, all of this heat is coming inside, but it's not getting out. It's not getting out, so we're just like cooking, right? So we don't want our atmosphere to be too thick because then it's going to be too warm. Because space, um, it's really cold. So if our atmosphere is really thin, our Earth would be too cold. Now our atmosphere makes it so that it's just right. Everything is just right. Not only that, but our location in the solar system, which those two lines represent something called a habitable zone. Our earth is within this habitable zone. Now you have Venus that is a little closer to the sun. And what do you know about Venus? Look at its color, by the way. It's red. It's, it's pretty, it's dry. It's pretty hot in there. Do you think they have water there? No, they don't have water. Then you have Mars and Mars is too cold, right? If you want to give it a guess. If you don't remember science, cause I don't remember learning this when I was younger. I remember learning this because I had to teach it, all right? That's kind of how it worked out. So picture these three. Have you guys heard the Goldilocks story, right? You have Papa Bear's bowl, and Papa Bear's bowl was too... It was too hot, right? It was too hot. <laughs> it's too big. <laughs> it was too big. Um, you have Mama Bear's bowl, which was too small. Too small. <laughs> it, was, it was too cold. Probably because Mama Bear poured her bowl first, and then she had to go pick up the kid that was crying, go change, right? Probably had to do that, right? She had to wait till the end to eat. So her bowl was too cold, but Baby Bear's bowl was just, <laughs> it was too special. <laughs> See, this is just like teaching high school science. It's actually great. You guys are helping me practice for two weeks from now when I'm back in the classroom, right? Now, atmosphere and distance determine temperature. If the earth, do you see how it starts, the green starts to fade out in the picture? I know it's kind of far over on the back. If the earth was 10% closer to the sun, it would be too hot. 10% closer, that's it. Which translates to like a couple, like, Less than 100 miles or so, or no, about 100 miles. If it was 50% further away, then it would be too cold. So Josh and Daniel, when you were doing this, do you think it, would just, it was just so easy to be able to get in the habitable zone? It wasn't. 
Do you think anybody could just say like, oh yep, I'm just gonna throw a bunch of ping pong balls and they're all gonna land and one of them is just gonna happen to land in that specific spot? Only God, right? So Chrissy was like, God. Yeah, <laughs> only God would be able to place on earth with the right atmosphere, the right elements, the right distance from the sun in order for you and I to be here this morning. Isn't that crazy? Alan, I can't do it. Can you scroll down a little bit on my notes, please? Because I am. You're doing great. Yep. I see it. Almost there. There you go. There you go. So why do I tell you all of this this morning? What I want to cause in you, and I hope I'm doing this, I want to cause a sense of awe in you for God's creation. And as I do that, I want to create the sense of awe for God, your creator, to bring glory and honor to him, to remind ourselves what the word, what scripture says about him, that through him, all things were made, and they're also for him. So, I keep thinking, why do I keep thinking that I'm the author of my own story, the creator of this world, when he shows me every single day through the things that I see that he is God, that he is the one in control? And to me, this is a reminder to step back and to allow God to do what he does by when you just... Take a walk, right, and you see his word. And in the part in me that is anxious, that is fearful, wants to control everything. And I want to have all of the answers all of the time because then, then I would be considering myself safe. But God is saying to me, I'm the one that holds all things together. I'm the one that made this earth. I, I'm the one that holds it all. You don't have to worry about any of that. The prophet Nehemiah um, offers this reflection as well in his book. You alone are the Lord. You made the skies and the heavens and all the stars. You made the earth and the sea and everything in them. You preserve them, preserve them all and the angels of heaven worship you. One of my coworkers talked about worship and he said, worship is not, we have such a limited view on worship that we think worship is just singing. Worship sometimes is just coming to church. Worship is in, in the way that you live your life. Worship is in the times that you go and you sit on the beach and you just listen to the waves. Worship is in the way that you use the mind, the body, the heart that God gave you to bring glory and honor back to him. That is worship. And when you think about it, nature worships God every single day, 24-7. And it's nature, right? And we are made in God's image. So how much more should we not also be doing that in all that we do, in all that we are? I have two more passages for you. Psalm 19, I think this one is, if you've grown up in the church or if you've been coming to church uh, for a little bit, this is one that many of us hear. Psalm 19, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. Sometimes I just watch a sunset and my, my breath just is gone. My words are gone. I have nothing else, right, besides just staying there, sitting there, taking it all in and giving thanks to God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. <clears throat> Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. Sometimes we think that if we have the right words to say, if we can say it in the right way, in the right tone, in the right language, then God can use us. Then, then yes, God, I allow you to speak through me. But God, God says, nature, the heavens already do this without a word. 
you don't have to declare my power, my glory by speaking. So if you're like me, I don't like speaking in front of people. And I know that's kind of crazy to think about. I don't do that. I just allow God to do that through me. Because if I was doing it by my own strength, I know that I would not be standing here this morning. And Psalm 8. Lord, or our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, God set it in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings, do you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the work of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the, of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. And why do I tell you all of this? Why do I give you all of these lessons of nature? Because I want to remind you that God is in the details. I want you to, God is a God of intention, a God of purpose, of delicate care. In nature, his world is a reflection of a creator God who made all of this, and he called it good. And in Matthew 6, there's a a phrase, and I'm going to paraphrase it here, that if he does all of this for nature, he figures out all of these species interactions. He learns the correct distance to place the earth from the sun so that you and I could be here this morning. How much more then does God care for you? If he cares this much for nature. And he says that he just made us just lower than the angels and he crowns us with glory and honor so if we are able to appreciate the beauty of creation and all that god has made outside shouldn't we do the same for those that are sitting around us aren't we also god's creation that's the plan there's a plan to all that god has made Sometimes there are relationships and connections we might not see yet, but it's a miracle that we are here today. Let me tell you, this is a miracle that we are here today because to me, none of this is chance. I don't think this is chance, right? And that's what I want to leave you with today, and I'm going to remind you of that. God feeds the sparrow in the fields. He dresses the lilies with beauty and splendor. And this is nature. How much more does your Father in heaven love you, who he made in his image? And how, and I encourage you to extend that same love and appreciation for the people that sit next to you, the people that you encounter each day.